that's really it. Um, it's kind of a roundabout way of saying I experienced sexist remarks, um, you know, my idea or ideas were diminished. I wasn't assisted to fully develop that idea. And I was made to feel like, that idea is not newsworthy, and in truth it is. But I feel like it all boils down to the taboo-ness of periods overall. We don't like to talk about periods in Jamaica, and if we do have that conversation, it, it's uncomfortable for a lot of people because it's connected with uncleanliness and dirtiness, and how dare you bring that up in the space of other people that's something you keep hush hush behind the walls in your bathroom you handle it there and leave it at that but that's why we have period poverty because we don't talk about it because we don't tackle the situation Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Caribbean Climate Calabash where we share stories that matter to young climate journalists around the world. I'm your host for today's episode, Dizan Billy, and I'm Climate Tracker's Caribbean Regional Director. My Caribbean colleagues, we just wrapped up the first ever Caribbean Climate Justice Journalism Award and I'm very proud to chat today with one of the winners, Candice Stewart from Jamaica. So, Candice, thank you so much for being us, with, being with us. Before we get into, into it, we really would appreciate if you could subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review, and share it with your friends as well. You can find it uh, at climatetrackercaribbean.org, all right? And when you subscribe, please like, review, and share the podcast. You are letting the funders know that the investment is having an impact on real people and you play an important role in the ecosystem. And we appreciate your support so very much. So let's get into it. Candice Stewart from Jamaica, journalist, writer, extraordinaire. Candice, we'd love to hear a little bit more about yourself before we get into your story. All right. Hi, Design again. Thank you for having me. Hello to everyone listening, to everyone watching. Uh, my name is Candy Stewart, Jamaican. I am a storyteller at heart, you know, and I also dare to say I am a journalist because I am a journalist, you know. Um, there's a whole story behind me saying that because I am not particularly trained as a journalist you know i didn't go to journalism school or all of that but i partake in the art of journalism so i'm a journalist um i'm also a fellow of uh, the recently wrapped second cohort of the climate tracker um climate justice journalism fellowship one of 15 and it was good um what else about me I enjoy writing naturally and I love music. Not a Swifty, but I love music. (laughs) Tell us a little bit about the music that you like, Candice. We'd love to know. Okay, sure. So um, I enjoy reggae music. I enjoy original dance hall music, meaning rock steady rent a tile which is a phrase used when you stand in one position and you move and groove to the music i also enjoy um r b jazz uh pop i mean you know still not a swifty but i do enjoy pop <laughs> and i enjoy rap r b most most genres because i even listen to um rock and rock variations so i like queen for example so yeah awesome so if i was if I, if I if if somebody's listening right who has never heard of this thing called rock steady which is the band or who is the artist that you would tell them you have to listen to this person Oh, Jesus. <laughs> you put me on the spot. Oh, my God. All right. Um, you can listen to anything from Alton Ellis. And, you know, 
I believe he even did a song called Rocksteady. Google Alton Ellis, A-L-T-O-N-E-L-L-I-S and Rocksteady and you'll see it. So start there and then you'll get a whole list there. Nice. So this podcast has stories, it has music. We love it. All right. So <laughs> let's get into your story, Candice. And the title that you chose for your story, A Look at Period Poverty Experiences in Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago. Tell mm. us first a little bit about what is period poverty, because it's something that I feel we are seeing more people speak about. And your story is one that went a lot of places. It had a lot of reach. But how would you describe period poverty um, to someone who is now hearing about it for the first time or a very young person who um, has no idea what it is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so in general terms, period poverty is really identified as the lack of access to menstrual products so we're talking about pads tampons you know the traditional and of course the more sustainable ones right however that's a general definition what it goes so much deeper than that period poverty also includes a lack of education in how to properly use these products how to properly dispose of them as well as uh the lack of resources to properly manage your menstrual hygiene so we're talking about do you have water piped water for example do you have um tissue do you have soap to wash your hands to clean up that kind of thing so it's generally classified as the first thing i said which is a lack of access to menstrual products but it goes so much deeper than that it goes much deeper than what I even just said, so yeah. Nice, thank you for sharing that. So is it a significant issue in Jamaica, in Trinidad and Tobago, in the Caribbean? What really inspired you to say, okay, this is a topic that I think relates to climate change and we'll get into that a little bit, but why was this something that stood out to you as a topic that needed to be addressed for Jamaica, for Trinidad and Tobago and the wider Caribbean? Okay, Um. so, I mean, an island girl, I live in Jamaica, I live within the Caribbean, right? But periods and the experience embedded in your lifestyle or your, your reality rather of period poverty is not unique to us. Whether Jamaican, Trinidadian, within the Caribbean region, it's a global issue. And... I wanted to focus on Jamaica because I do live here. I am Jamaican and I also wanted to get the perspective outside of Jamaica, but still within the, the region. Um, the story behind it is interesting. And the more I think about it after winning the award, the more I realize that I've been talking about periods for a very long time, just in different aspects. So I, I have a blog a personal blog called the Suburban Girl JA. And many years ago, emphasis on many, I would write about my period experiences, whether I had a stain or whether I had to go into the, the store to get some period products. And because it is kind of a taboo, not kind of, it is a taboo um, topic. You don't really talk about periods or having periods in Jamaica, and I'm sure it's the same elsewhere. Um, so I, in those experiences, I was really awkward in how I approach these, these experiences. And anywho, um, I know of people who have experienced period, period poverty, who are experiencing period poverty, and I wanted to write a story. This is a story I did during the fellowship, by the way. So I wanted to write a story that goes beyond the usual um, heat exposure and, you know, hurricanes. Like, those are important topics, but there's so much more to explore. So I wanted it to be relatable to me and to other people. So I said, you know what? Let's look at periods. You need water, access to water. So I did that. I did some a little bit of research and I went into it and I was in a space 
where I spoke with an editor of mine and I shared the idea that I wanted to look at period poverty and its relationship with uh, water scarcity. So the idea wasn't quite fully developed, but it was there. Period poverty, lack of water, and how they meet. But the editor looked at me and laughed in my face. <laughs> and he said, that's a waste of a story. You need to toss that story to him. I, I clutched my proverbial pearls and I took offense to that because how dare you tell me that a story that could be so great have no worth. You know, you wouldn't even help me to break it down as an editor should. Anywho, I walked away, thought about it, and I went back to him, I think a day later, and I said to him, I am still going to do that story, regardless of how you feel. If you want to push it out, that's that's your business, but if you don't, I'll push it out otherwise. And he proceeded to tell me a story about how he grew up in rural Jamaica, and he, you know, his mother, and I believe he said siblings, but of course aunts and other women in his life, would have experienced a lack of um, water access within pipes at least, and they they manage their periods. And I and and then he tried to downplay the idea to say it's not worth exploring because he knew women or he knows women who have their periods, they don't have access to water like that, and they still make it through. So it's a waste. So <laughs> I didn't know what to, to how to respond to that because I just felt like he was telling me my idea is nonsensical when it really isn't, you know. First of all, you don't know what a period is like, even if you have your experiences without water, otherwise as a man or a human in general, a period, managing your period is totally different. Even if you see a woman or a girl manage their period, it's multifold, you know? So I guess I was persistent enough and there were other issues going on, but I decided to leave that space and then I believe it was you. I spoke with you and also Hippolyte on my mentor and I said, you know, guys, I don't know what's going to happen. And Hippolyta said, no worries. I will get you, help you to publish that story. And you said, I'll also help you to get that story published elsewhere as well. That's really it. Um, it's kind of a roundabout way of saying I experienced sexist remarks, um, you know, my idea or ideas were diminished. I wasn't assisted to fully develop that idea. And I was made to feel like that idea is not newsworthy. And in truth, it is. But I feel like it all boils down to the tabooness of periods overall. We don't like to talk about periods in Jamaica. And if we do have that conversation, it's it's uncomfortable for a lot of people because it's connected with uncleanliness and dirtiness and how dare you bring that up in the space of other people. That's something you keep hush-hush behind the walls, in your bathroom, you handle it there and leave it at that. But that's why we have period poverty because we don't talk about it because we don't tackle the situation. Okay. <laughs> I don't know, Candice, if I were you and I was being mansplained, mm -hmm. uh, like about periods i don't know i think i might have like thrown something out the window or like maybe ask him to be honest um and that is on the record uh but that is i i mean i really commend you on on how you bounce back from that and that story and this story went on to win you this award imagine that. It has went on to be you know uh to be translated in so many different languages and and really published in a um republished and so on so this story i mean obviously it's something that people want to know about right yeah so i just commend you on not giving up on that at all mm -hmm. and i think maybe what we can do next is just talk a little bit about how period poverty can be exacerbated by climate change Mm -hmm. um, because I think this is something that you really brought out well in your story. So for, for our listeners, can you pro probably provide some examples of how environmental changes are making it harder for women and girls to access menstrual products and how, 
how the climate crisis is really making period poverty more of an issue. All right. Um, so as I said, you know, period poverty is multifold, but for the purpose of our conversation, um, climate change and climate change events. One of the biggest ones, um, droughts, which filter into water issues, water concerns. So we're talking about uh, no water in your pipes, no water in the stream behind your house, down the road, the river, like there's just no water or very little water. And when that happens, you then have to consider how are you going to manage your menstrual hygiene on top of water to drink, water to bathe, water to cook with, and water to clean your environment with, right? Also included in that is like um, water for your toilets and all of that. When you don't have access to water to do all of those things, you have to sometimes prioritize. Some women, because when I was doing the story, I had spoken with um, the executive director of a local NGO called Herflow Foundation, and the the ED executive director is um, Shelly Ann Weeks, and she shared with me that most women and girls who experience period poverty are already in poverty. So when you had to add their period into the mix, that exacerbates it. When you add no water into the mix, that makes it even worse, right? Um, so when you don't have water, you have to prioritize. I need to be able to cook food so that my, my kids, myself, you know, if I'm a mother and I have children, can eat. And that's why you prioritize it. Even when you step a little bit outside of climate change and just look at poverty overall, you can't afford to pay for certain things. So you prioritize again. Do I buy two packs of sanitary napkins or tampons versus food for us to eat? Um, but bring it, bring it back to climate change events now. So I just spoke about briefly, very briefly, about droughts and how the lack of water because of droughts can impact. So when you look at excessive water, excessive precipitation, you know, that leads to flooded streets or um, what's the word, turbidity in the pipes or the water that comes out, it's either murky or heavily silted, it's dirty, you can't use it. That is also lack of water, you know, just because water is coming through your pipes doesn't mean that you can use it. You cannot use it for anything. Even if you use at home treatment, um, pills, for example, the tablets, you drop it in to clear the water or you boil it or you add bleach and you leave it to sit. It's still not 100% safe, but it is much safer. Um, that can also pose a problem because you're putting it on your skin, you're using it to help you maintain your menstrual hygiene. And when you do that, or rather when you have the turbid water, you cannot use it. So it kind of is similar to not having water in your pipes. What are you going to do? You're going to have to take extra precautions. And in some cases, you have to pay, pull from your pocket and pay for trucks to carry water to you. Sometimes it's inexpensive and sometimes it's not, but affordability is relative. Yeah. And not everybody lives in the upper echelons of society. Not everybody has the money to do that because they have to prioritize. Um, I should have prefaced all of this by saying I am by no means a period poverty expert. I am just a girl <laughs> who had this idea and I wanted to write this story. And, you know, so I'm learning as I go. But there is, it's so far and wide, you know, I remember reading that, I, I believe a, a World Bank report said over 500 million women and girls, they, 
they experience period poverty and it impacts their lives. And speaking of statistics, um, the same foundation by Shelley and, Shelley and Weeks, they did um, a study that revealed that 42, 42% of girls experience period poverty and it impacts their, their lives. And I also read a report, I believe this one was based in Trinidad and Tobago that says over 68% of women are impacted by, by their periods. So, well, they experience period poverty and they miss about three days each week from work and or school because of their periods. And that's another thing, that's another effect, you know, you could say that period poverty overall causes for women and girls. They don't have the resources, so it don't make sense for them to go on the road, go to school, go to work when they, they're facing this issue. They don't have any sanitary napkins or any kind of product to help them throughout the day. It doesn't make sense for them to leave the house. So they stay home, they miss out on work, they miss out on school. And that is in cases where the school or even the teacher doesn't put measures in place for that student or the group of students in this predicament. Um, yeah, 68%. I don't remember what the size was, the sample size was, but 68 is a lot. And I'm not sure what the sample size was for Jamaica with the 42%, but that's also a lot, you know? And those are what the studies captured. There are so many more unreported cases, you know what I mean? And people like, like me, I've never truly experienced period poverty like others, but I have had to endure times where I don't have a sanitary napkin or I don't have a tampon and I would literally go to the bathroom and pull the tissue, roll it up, create a makeshift pad and insert it on or, or lay it flat on my underwear and, and keep it moving. And I know some women and girls, to preserve the, the sanitary napkin that they're using, they do the same thing to, to, to create like a barrier so that they don't have to use too much over a period of time. Shelly Ann Weeks, again, I spoke a, a great deal with her. She shared with me that um, she knows of a story where a mother, and I believe she has two girls, you know, they would have had to share sanitary napkins. I don't mean that you have a package of 10 and you take out. What she said was they had one and they rotated it because of the experience that they were going through. Um, in one of the interviews that I did, for the award-winning story. So I spoke with two girls or two women um, in Jamaica and one in Trinidad. One of the women in Jamaica, I believe she's from the Rosetown area in Kingston and specifically in an area within Rosetown called Garden Lane. She said to me that they've always had water scarcity issues. Some of it not necessarily caused by climate change, but that plays a great factor. And what they have to do is they have to pay someone to go to a neighboring community and use his wheelbarrow and carry back buckets of water, containers of water for them to use. And she said something to me. Um, she said they have to wash the possibles, which if you think about it, you know what that means, you know? So to not use too much water so that there is enough for other areas of her life or her 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 household's life. It's crazy. Yeah, exactly. So thanks so much for going in depth into that. And I think it's something that really passes over all of the the legislation and all of the policy and all of that, you know, that fancy tech those fancy technical terms and so on. It passes over so much of that because 
to be honest, women's health is something that has not it historically has not been prioritized, right? Mm -hmm. Um so when we when you come with a story like this for your for your editor, um you can see why it's not um deemed something that's newsworthy. But the fact is that the Caribbean is in a water crisis, mm -hmm. right? Caribbean islands we are in a water crisis and our governments, you know, are being warned that water scarcity will become our new norm you know so many of our countries are on the list of top 10 most water scarce countries in the world you know and within the past five years i remember i was reading an article recently about water scarcity in the caribbean and it mentioned that within the past five years every island in the region has experienced some sort of water scarcity and for example trinidad and tobago is experienced it's, it's currently experiencing its worst drought in recent memory and to be honest like we are not seeing rain <laughs> we are not seeing water 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 is something that now we're, we're being faced or forced to have to do um like water schedules and that sort of thing right we so yeah. residents are being put under water restrictions through the past couple months you know and uh but even now you're getting a fine for using water in your hose, like that sort of thing. If they find you using water in your hose, in your yard and so on, you get a fine, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's, 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 it's that serious. And I remember also Dominica, I think the article also mentioned that Dominica, you know, considered the nature island of the Caribbean and also it has other, others has its mountains and rainforests and so on. It's also seeing significant decreases in freshwater resources. And this is something that is being, replicated across the entire region so when we consider these types of things we really have to bring it back home to think about how does this impact more than industry or in addition to industry and agriculture and these things that we think of automatically how does it also affect health and how does it affect women's health you know so this story i think is something that we i would love to see even like more follow-up like follow-up visions of your story um just to get it more out there and so on and see what the impacts are. Mm -hmm. I think my next question for you, Candice, would be about um, if you can share with us some insights um, about, you mentioned some of the interviews that you did and so on, but was it easy or was it difficult to find information for the story, seeing as it's something that's not really reported on? What was that process like for you? Uh, okay, so, Parts of it was easy and parts were not, right? Um, the, the parts where I had to capture water scarcity concerns was not particularly difficult because as you rightfully said, all of us <laughs> in the region were, were facing the crisis right now. And even in Jamaica, um water lock-off schedules happen and some communities they haven't seen water in a while they have to get trucked water and all of that story um but it wasn't too difficult because many reports have been done many articles have been done there there is a constant conversation about droughts excessive heat, water conservation, um, lack of precipitation, all of that. And it wasn't too difficult to get information on period poverty from the aspect of getting in touch with some persons. It took a little work, but it wasn't necessarily difficult. You know, I just had to to ask around a lot or do a little more research because I got in touch with Shelly and Weeks. Um, I got in touch, I follow this organization called PERIOD, in all caps, P-E-R-I-O-D, and there is the punctuation period at the end. It's not local based, it's not regional based, it's based in the US, but they are trying to stretch across the world. Um, I literally just went on their Instagram page and found their website and I sent them an email and 
to my surprise, they responded. I was I was not hopeful, but they responded favorably. And I was um, able to book an interview with a representative from the organization. The problem came where I wanted to talk with people who have experienced period poverty, you know? So the subject matter experts like Shelly and Weeks, the folks from period and sustainable, my God, from Trinidad and Tobago, Chantal Lane, and a few others, um, that was easy. You know, it was just a matter of booking interviews, but the people who are actually experiencing it, nobody wanted to talk to me and <laughs> nobody wanted to talk to me and i think a part of it is because they, they don't want to be identified as someone who is in this experience you know whether it's poverty period poverty or just overall again the topic is taboo not many people like to talk about it it makes them uncomfortable so I got in touch with Aisha Constable from Girls Care JA, and I believe it was you who made the suggestion. And fun, fun story, I know Aisha outside of this entire conversation. And I, you know, I asked her, I told her what I was doing, and I asked her if she could recommend someone. And she connected me with two young ladies, and that's how I got in touch with them. And my connection with Shanta Leng from um, Sustainable TT comes where in the same space that editor I told you about, I, I stumbled across, I think it was a research paper, it was a mini research paper that Sustainable had either done or they were a part of. And I read it. Um, and I, you know, I wrote an article on it in that other space. And it was from that that I was able to get in touch with her. But nobody wanted to talk to me about their personal experiences. And I didn't want to necessarily include mine because I thought it would have come off as being quite pretentious. You know, I'm not necessarily a period. I don't experience period poverty like other people aspects of it sometimes but consistently no it's just a one or two situation um yeah you know human interest stories can be a problematic when humans don't want to talk to you so that was yeah a yeah yeah Okay, well, thank you so much, Candice, for chatting with me, uh, with us uh, <laughs> uh, today. I think, um, Candice, what is next for you in terms of the stories that you want to tell? Because what we've noticed is that you're really interested in these human interest stories. And I think that that is important because these are the stories that aren't really told from a Caribbean perspective. So what do you see next for you in terms of your storytelling or if, even if it's not what you see but what you hope for mm -hmm. what do you envision uh, for yourself as a storyteller related to climate change or just generally 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 um you know as you said i am a storyteller i identify myself firstly as a storyteller i just want to continue to tell more stories like that since winning um the award i i wrote a story about not climate change related but i wrote a story about um a lady who had it's a sensitive sensitive topic but since the age of five and up until she was in her 20s she endured abuse mostly sexual abuse from mostly people that she knew and in her adult years or her 40s she started an organization dedicated to helping women and girls who are victims or survivors of abuse. So I wrote that story recently. Um, back to period poverty, I I met a young lady, her name is Katrina Daly, a student, but she may have graduated by now because when I spoke with her, she had just completed her last day of college. 
um, or her, her, her program. Um, and she started an initiative called Empower Her Flow. I think, hold on. Yes, Empower Her Flow School Tour. And it came out of a class project that she had to do, but it turned into something great. And I, I noticed her because there was a feature done on her on TV and about her project. And she collaborated with a local organization called Women in Empowering Women. And they did a school tour, you know, focusing on girls, exposing them to periods, how to manage it, what, what a period is, because some of them may not have even started their periods. Um, so I'm actually going to write a story about her collaboration with Women Empowering Women um, I just want to tell more stories. I've realized that it's something that I enjoy and I do it very well. Um, yeah, I also started a new blog called Candidly Climate Caribbean. There's only one story on it right now, but we get in there. And I also hope to actually start a podcast for that same platform. Um, yeah, so just telling more stories. Love that. I really love that. And I love that you just said, I don't know if you realize, but you just said that you're good at it. And that is something that I love that to hear that from you because you really are. So keep up the great work, Candice. Thank you. And I think that this award, you know, it really was a deserving because this story, it really, really was necessary. So thanks for joining us, Candice. And that's it for the show. It was really nice having you, Candice. And all of our listeners, thank you for tuning in. I am Dizan Billy, and this is the Caribbean Climate Calabash podcast. You can visit our website at climatetrafficcaribbean.org to read climate justice stories from across the Caribbean region, subscribe to our newsletter, and get to know more about us. Have a great week. Until next time. Bye.